For New Zealanders, the ocean is closely connected to our culture. We all live close to the coast, really. We all engage with it in many, many different ways. The sea helps regulate the climate. It generates 60% of the oxygen we breathe. Most of the carbon that's stored on the planet is stored in the ocean, and we've been very slow as a nation and, in fact, as a planet to really recognise that. For a country with a marine space 14 times the size of land, that's just nutty. New Zealanders love the ocean, we love to go to the beach, but that doesn't mean that we can continue just to do anything that we want and be oblivious to the effects that we're having on it. There are limits to what we can do, and I don't think we want to exceed those limits. The problem with the marine environment is that a lot of it is out of sight, so it's hard for people to see what's going on. As we start to think about the ocean as an ecosystem, then we start to think about all of the connections that exist between different kinds of plants and animals and all these physical and chemical processes that go on within the system. And that in itself really opens up a world of wonder. There's so much innovation potential in a Mātauranga lead approach. We're talking about thousands of years of relationship and, and knowledge and experience. Why wouldn't we want to benefit from that? Why wouldn't we want to create space where that knowledge is valued and centred? The sea is part of our life, but we've always known that we have to protect the sea. It's our responsibility to act as kaitiaki. Any activity that we do in the marine environment creates what we call stresses. So it's not a case of one activity, one stressor. There's lots and lots of stresses. There's sedimentation, there's suspended sediment extraction, new invasive species, temperature, salinity, pH, nutrients. Increasingly, there's all sorts of other ones as well, microplastics and estrogen mimics, and it just goes on forever. When you put stress on something, it slowly changes. You get this, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Oh, goody, we can keep doing this. And then all of a sudden, bang, yeah. you've gone over this tipping point. There's stresses that are occurring in the sea, overfishing in some parts, overharvesting a kaimawana. But really, in estuaries and nearshore coastal environments, the big problems are the continual input of sediment that's been greatly accelerated by our activities on land. And increasingly, as we intensify the horticulture and agriculture on the land, an increasing input of nutrients into these systems as well. Some of those impacts are easy to manage. Fishing, believe it or not, is easy to manage because that's just a human activity that that can be controlled. Sediment impacts could take generations before we see a recovery. I started researching the reefs in the late 90s, looking at the long-term changes and the impacts that humans have on them. But at that time, Kinnabarans were just considered to be a normal part of our reefs. A Kinnabarran is an area of reef underwater where the kinna have eaten all of the seaweeds and all the kelp. 
that started occurring once we'd fished out all of the major predators for kinna. So tamari, the snapper, kora, the crayfish, as well as blue cod in the South Island. So that predation pressure that kept kinna populations low has substantially reduced, which has allowed barrens to form in lots of areas. The healthy reef ecosystems throughout Aotearoa are, are generally dominated by kelp forests. They support lots of species, they provide food and habitat. They store carbon and they can help potentially offset CO2 emissions. So there's importance in terms of having healthy biodiversity on the reefs. Poor Nights has traditionally been thought of as a reasonably pristine marine environment, but it's currently being impacted by very large issues, most likely to do with climate change. It's actually a different urchin species out here called Centrostephanus, which is a subtropical species. But over the last few years, probably because of slightly warmer temperatures, it's really boomed. With the lack of kelp, it certainly looks less healthy to me. There's bare rocks covered in filamentous algae, which I always associate with an unhealthy ecosystem. I don't think it really is sustaining a lot of biodiversity. They're a very big urchin and they have very long spines. So the only predator that we know of that will eat Centrostephanus is crayfish and also packhorse lobster, but the numbers are pretty low. And so that's where we're seeing the problem with our systems are already stressed and under impact, which make them less resilient to these new threats that we're seeing through climate change. So what we're looking at here is a vast seagrass meadow on the intertidal here at Otomotai Peninsula. This seagrass plays really important ecological roles within these systems. It harbours a lot of biodiversity, so it's actually a really good indicator of a healthy estuarine ecosystem. Estuaries are the kidneys of the coastal environment, so they act as a massive filter. The animals that inhabit the sediments play crucial roles in maintaining the health of these ecosystems. We have this little shellfish here, Macamona liliana. It does a phenomenal amount of work in these sediments. It lives deep in the sediments and has a long siphon that comes up onto the surface and begins to scoop up the microscopic plants that live on the surface of these sediments. It sorts out the food and then the water comes out through an exhalant siphon and that water is rich in nutrients, rich in nitrogen that then fuels the plants either sitting on the surface. And when we begin to lose these kinds of animals from the system, the system begins to lose productivity and that's when we start getting into trouble. If the estuaries begin not to function as they once were, that just shifts the problem into the coastal zone. We get a darkening of those coastal waters, our kelp forests begin to get impacted, and the system begins to degrade. We have many laws probably over 50 pieces of legislation and relevant policies that impact on how New Zealanders use and protect marine and coastal environments. And local communities know better than anyone else what the stresses and the impacts are facing marine environments because they live there, they work there and they see it every day. And so we need to have that place-based knowledge feeding up into our development of legal and policy frameworks. 
as well as the top-down international best practice concepts. Fisheries, conservation, biodiversity, resource management, they need to be looked at holistically in place. And the other scale aspect to that is time. What do we need to do today, but what are we doing to make sure we've got better outcomes in 100 years' time, or 500 years' time? There's a lot that we can do now within the legal frameworks that we already have and the policies that we already have. There are already some really fantastic management mechanisms, protection mechanisms for the oceans that just haven't really been used. Largely, they come down to how that's funded and resourced and how it's enabled. There needs to be urgency displayed. Business as usual is not working. There is a disconnect hierarchically between national and local levels. Um, and we need to work out how to overcome that. There is no single person or agency or group that's responsible. It does have to be a collective effort. That's the, the regulators, that's the policy makers, that's the iwi leaders, the ecologists, the human geography lecturer, you know, that's the person who likes to go for a swim on the weekend. All has a role to play in trying to have a moana in a state that we want to interact with it. We, katoa, all of us, have to start acting in a manner of kaitiakitanga. We've got to always have in the back of our head that we have a responsibility to protect, to enhance, not just to rape and pillage. So I'm a real pro for a collaborative approach. They're difficult because you've got to learn to trust each other, but in my opinion, the end results are far more powerful than if you're doing everything as an individual.